so-called knowledge that I've just picked up in the last few years, actually. And um, hopefully you'll be able to take some home with you and carry it throughout your life, too, and make things a little easier for us. I always say I, I love to, to be with groups like this because you're my kind of people. So um, We're going to start with talking about um, clothing. We talked a little bit about makeup, how important makeup is to us um, last night. But I, I think we need to be aware um, how important clothing is to us also. You know, we don't want to think, well, we have to look a certain part. But what you have to realize is that we're always looked at, more so than anyone else. And so we need to maybe make more of a conscious effort to look our very best because we're out there trying to change attitudes of people. And if they see us looking uh, sloppy or uh, maybe not looking the best that we possibly can, that's the impression that they're going to get. You know, other people can kind of get away with it, but we have a hard time because we're, we're not only looked at once, but twice. And many times they even take a triple to, to turn around and look at us. So we have to make sure that we look the very best that we can. Um, I, I, when I first entered the pageant um, in Utah, I was 80 pounds heavier than I am now. And I, I felt that that was really a disability for me, that I was compounding my disabilities. I actually had two disabilities. <coughs> one was my weight, the other one was polio. And I thought, one I can do something about, the other one I can't. So I decided that I was going to change the one thing that I could, and so I went into a diet program, a very healthy diet program, where they monitored, uh, they gave me an EKG every 10 weeks, they drew blood every 8 weeks to make sure that, you know, I was staying healthy on the diet and that I wasn't losing weight too fast. It took me a whole entire year to lose it, and I remember before that time I always thought, I'll never lose weight because I can't exercise. You know, that was my excuse to myself, that I, I can't lose weight, but, but you really can, you do not have to have a rigid exercise program to, to be able to lose weight. It takes a little longer, but you, you know, you can do it. Um, but I felt a lot better after that, and I thought, you know, I've got to start changing things, and I've got to start feeling better about myself and wanting to, to make a difference. And um, I remember at first, I, I didn't worry that much about what I wore, you know. I thought, well, you know, I can get away with this. But, you know, as you start feeling better about yourself, then you start realizing that, hey, that's not going to do anymore. And you've got to change the whole person, not just a part of the person. And so clothes became um, a real important thing for me. And it was fun to shop because I actually could go into the smaller size departments. And I thought, this is, this is pretty. In fact, today I even find myself going to the larger women's sections and going through there. And then I think, oh, I shouldn't be here. You know, I can go over here. And so it's, it's kind of fun to shop now. But I also realized that we don't all have a lot of money. We don't all have, uh, we can't all go to wine stocks. I don't know if you have a wine stocks here, but you have some of the more expensive stores. In fact, your clothing here is a lot more expensive than it is in, in Salt Lake, I noticed, traveling around. Because I was going to buy me something, but I can't afford to buy it here. <laughs> so, um, so I thought we have to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So here we are, adaptive people to begin with. You know, I don't like to use the term disabled because I don't think any of us are disabled. I think we're adaptive people because we adapt everything in our life as we, we grow, if we grow up from a disability or whether we're disabled at an older age, we, we actually adapt our whole lives. And so you have to become adaptive and you need to find other resources for your clothing. Now, now this outfit that I have on today, now it's probably a very expensive, suit, wouldn't you think? Do you know how much I spent for this suit? Who has an idea of maybe what I would have spent for this suit that I have on? $80. $75. I went into a thrift store and this suit was $6.95. But now wait. I didn't spend $6.95. I went on half price day. So therefore, I got this suit for next to nothing. You know, so you can you can do it. You don't have to to wear, uh, you don't have to, if you happen to have to live in a nursing home, for instance, you don't have to look like you live in a nursing home. Not for, not for $2.95 or whatever I spent for this suit. You don't have to. The shoes still are marked on the bottom. Let me see what I spent for these little puppies. A dollar ninety-five for the shoes. Okay, so you know I learned that I have to look good, but I don't have to spend those prices to look good because I figured 
It's the rich people who give away their clothes. It's the poor people like me that hand them down to somebody that can use them. But the rich people don't care who get them, so they just take them to the store and drop them off. Now, it isn't, it isn't easy. You don't go in there and you don't automatically go to a rack and say, well, this is it. You know, I've been looking for this. This is it. You have to spend a lot of time there. I'll go sometimes and I will spend like three hours in a day, but I go through the entire rack. You know, I don't, I don't, maybe I go home with nothing. And maybe I take a jacket home, and months down the road, I find the perfect skirt that goes with that jacket. I don't find it all at once many, many times. So you have to be real patient when you go to those places, and you have to kind of get it in your blood, you know, and then you, you have to go all of the time. You know, because I go like half price day, you don't keep me home. You know, I even take off, well, I haven't told her I take off work to go to half price day, but... <laughs> might get me in trouble with that one. Now she knows. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I picked up along the way, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how to take care of your clothes, how to travel with your clothes. And um, the, the shirt that I have on here, I had this, uh, this uh, suit, and I, I could not find a blouse to go with it. So I was going to go see the uh, governor, and I thought, I've got to have a blouse that goes with this thing. So I heard and left work, I went over to one of our department stores, and in the lingerie department on the cell rack, I found this silk top for, like, it's a night shirt, like, for $8. So I thought, well, gee, the suit only cost me 2 bucks. I can afford $8 for the, the shirt. So, so there for the whole outfit, uh, what am I in, $10? $10, well, 11 $12 for the shirt, you know. So here we are with the whole outfit. But let me show you some other things that I picked up. Now, this swimsuit would probably cost anywhere from, oh, 50 $40 to $50. I got this at a, a used clothing store for, I think, $4 was what I paid for that. And then I picked me up a pair of uh, lavender shorts to, as a cover-up to go over them for a couple of dollars. And then I have a, a lavender uh, top that I also got, a big top, to go over it for, like, $2 or something like that. So, you know, you just have to look, and that's... It's it's an okay swimsuit. It doesn't, you know, it's not, uh, I mean, it doesn't flatter my figure, but nothing does, so that's okay. Um, let's see what else we've got here. We'll have, let's take the lav la lavender next. Okay, these pants I got at another thrift store, and they're a dress pant. Um, I took them to the cleaners, which cost me a couple of bucks, but the pants cost me 25 cents at a yard sale, okay? And so... They're kind of a dress pant, and you can either dress it down or dress it up with whatever. Now, this is, this is just a casual top that I got for summer. And then this is kind of a, a linen-type top. And, and I think this, this top was probably um, $1.95, and this one was at a yard sale for $0.50. Cents. So, so, you know, you, can just, you just have to look around, and you just have to, to know what you're looking for and, and not just give up the first time you go anywhere. Um, let's take the black dress next, or the dress next. Now, I went to one of the finer thrift stores in Salt Lake. I mean, you know, I do shop finer thrift stores sometimes. This dress was probably, oh, probably close to a $100 dress because it's a, a silk material. And I spent $15 for that dress. And it's, it's really pretty on. And then I picked up the jacket at Kmart on sale for $6. So, you know, you've got a, a complimentary outfit there. You can either wear it without or, or with the jacket. So that's kind of a fun thing. And I didn't get them together. I mean, you know, I, uh, this jacket I just barely got. I've had the dress for over a year. So I finally found a jacket that was thin enough to go with the dress. Okay, then this little thing is just kind of a little casual dress. And I got this for $1.50 at a thrift store. And then the accessories, um, this year I went out to, uh, around to some of the different jewelry stores and I talked to this lady who has a, uh, dis well, a dis she has a wholesale business. And I asked her if she wanted to sponsor me for the year, which meant, you know, that she would give me a discount on my jewelry. And she said, sure, I'd love to do that. And now it's her main project. So I can go in there and get any of my jewelry at half price of what, what it would cost anyone else. And that, that you know, you can do that. You know, you can actually go out and, and have people help you. They're more than willing to help. Plus, it, it, you're not asking for a handout. 
you're just making them aware that the program's there and you start getting people involved and it's it's just a great resource to do that you know at first i thought are they going to think that i'm going out for handouts but you really aren't you're actually making them more aware of things and giving them the opportunity to be a part of it now this outfit this blouse i spent two dollars for and this skirt kind of just a little casual skirt i spent 75 cents for so and, and then the jewelry of course i'll i'll show you how to accessorize your clothes in a minute here this um outfit that she's bringing out now was a size 24 but because i love the dress so much i took it to a seamstress and she kept cutting it down for me at hardly no charge so here i wasn't that now this was an expensive outfit when i first bought it but I thought, gosh, I don't want to get that. It was too expensive to get rid of. So she kept cutting it down for me. Finally, the last time she said, this is it. You cannot cut this outfit down anymore. You cannot lose any more weight if you expect to wear this outfit. But we cut it down three different times so that I could still wear that outfit. And it's kind of a fun one. It's real springy and it's fun. And this other one is just kind of a casual thing. I found the skirt for a dollar. And I found the blouse for 25 cents at a yard sale. And this was probably six to eight months apart. I didn't find those at the same time. But when I saw the blouse, I automatically thought of the skirt I had back home and uh, got that. And it's just a, there it is in the front. It's just a button-down skirt in the front. It's kind of a fun skirt. That was. It's fun when you tr uh, travel with things like that, the cotton, because it's a lot more comfortable than some of your other materials. And then this jumpsuit, I thought, you know, what, what can I get that will be something that I can accessorize and just change all of the time? And that's what you want to do. You want to get something that you can make different and make it look totally different each time you wear it. And I don't know if you, do you have units out here? Do you? Okay. So that's a perfect place to go. And you can pick up these little things for, I think they're $4 or something like that. But you can change the look of something like that every time you wear it, or just different accessories. Or, and, you know, if you have a white dress or whatever, that's a good thing to get because you can just change it and, and change it any way you want. Or you can dress it up, dress it down. There's all different colors here. And then you can get, like, a silk scarf to wear to make it a little more dressy if you want to. But it's kind of fun to, to play with clothes. I've had a lot of fun doing it. But one important thing we have to remember is that once we get the clothes, we've got to take care of them and that's that's not always easy and we have to also try to look some of you have to look more than I do maybe for clothes that you can get in and out of easy and that's not always easy to find things like that but you know if you do find a seamstress that they're, they're more than willing to help you with things like that and it doesn't cost that much to have if you go get your clothes at a thrift store then you can afford to pay a seamstress to fix them the way that you need them you really can, and you're not out that much, and they fit perfect, and, and you've got your, your clothes. So it, it's advantageous to you to invest a little bit in, um, in having them altered to, to meet your size. Now, Denise, I wondered where you got your clothes.
And it's amazing when you go to these, these thrift stores, uh, you'll see a, a really nice blouse with a spot on it. Well, people don't know how to get spots out. Yeah. And so they give away a perfectly good blouse that you can take to the cleaners and have the spot removed. Or you can soak it in bids and do the trick yourself, you know. And it's a perfectly, I mean, it's many times a very expensive blouse. But they don't, they don't want to bother with it. You know, they just don't want to take the time to try to get that spot out. So. I have, I have a flannel shirt, and I, and I love this story. I have a flannel shirt that I bought for a dime. It's a decent shirt. And I have it in the Now that's just part of taking your time and having patience and keep going back, have a conscious effort of what you're doing and keep going back and, and not settling for the thirteen ninety nine even yeah. and going back and waiting for oh, it to even be lower. She, she hates it when I go shopping with her because I find all these bargains and I don't go to a thrift store because half of them aren't accessible anyway here in Des Moines. I'm going to pass around some pictures here of, of my dress that I wore at the national pageant. And I'll tell you the story behind this. Um, a friend of Jonette's who um, does some sewing for her, um, had her daughter had purchased this dress for 80-some dollars, okay, for her, a wedding. And she never was in the wedding, so the dress just laid around. Well, this woman was going to cut it up and make little kids' clothes out of it. I said, now wait a minute, that for her grandchildren. I said, now wait a minute, that's my size and I need a, a dress for the pageant. So she, she said, well, what you can do is pay me the money that it would cost for me to make, you know, to buy the material to make the dresses for the grandkids and then you can have this dress. Well, this $80 dress I got for $24 because that's what it cost for her to make the grandkids some clothes. So I'll go ahead and pass that one around. And it was a, a satin, it's real pretty. And then the um, dress that I wore the night that I gave my three-minute uh, time speech on stage, the skirt was 75 cents from a yard sale, the blouse was a dollar. So I'll pass that around so you can take a look at that one. And I'll just pass these around so you can look. And the, the dress that I have on here, this peach, I I think that was an expensive dress, Jonette. I don't think that was one you wanted. I had it cut down, though, however, and I still wear it, so it's it's... You know, let me show you. The, I'll pass yeah. that one because that is one I cut down. One of the things I did was with my wedding dress because I didn't want it just to hang in my closet. I had a friend of mine after my wedding take and cut the bottom off so it make it full length mm -hmm. and for me. And so it's not like a formal. So if we go anywhere where we need to be formally dressed, I can rewear my wedding dress. So that way I'm saving the money that I spent on my wedding dress. You bring up this wedding dress and it makes me laugh because yesterday, I don't know how many of you saw, um, what is the name of that show, not our magazine, but uh, that show we were watching with the, the wedding dress. Oh, 
No, it wasn't Donahue. It was another one. But anyway, there's a show on locally here with Kathy Crosby or whatever and oh, Regis. 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 Okay, there you are. That's the show. They showed a wedding dress that was made out of paper. Ooh. I mean, it was a ma it was a beautiful dress. It was made out of the bias, you know, the the interfacing is what it was. And then they had for the sleeves they had trash bags, you know, just wadded up into oh. these little flat. And they used coffee filters to make the flower. And inside for the little uh, center of the flower was Q-tips. I mean, this was an amazing dress, and it was all biodegradable. It was great, you know. And it cost, you know how much that wedding dress cost? Eight dollars. You know, I mean, it was, I just looked at that thing, and I thought, wow, I wish I would have known about that. If I would get married again, honey, it's going to be eight dollars. It's not going to be, you know, two hundred and some dollars. But, um, so it just shows you what we can do if we're inventive enough and we, we want to, to do things. But the important thing is that we do take care of the clothes once we get them. And that means laundering them correctly, reading the labels inside. Of course, sometimes if you get used clothing, you can't read the labels inside. So what I've done many times is take them to a dry cleaner and ask them what type of material this is. Can this be um, washed at home or do I need to have it dry cleaned? And they're usually very helpful to, to help you with that and let you know what, what kind of material they are. They're experts at it, so it works out really well. But in traveling, you know, you really have to have some inventive things to keep you going on the road. And so we've uh, come up with some things here that have helped me travel around. Um, this is my crown, okay? This was the crown that I got crowned with in Puerto Rico. It's very heavy, it's very um, beautiful, but it's not very practical. But I carry it, carry it in Rubbermaid. I mean, it keeps everything fresh, right? <laughs> so, so here we are, we have our little crown in the Rubbermaid, and, and it also doubles to put the go sashes in too. And they, they made me several of these so that I could color coordinate them, you know. Of course, they've made them a little late. My rain's almost over, and I just got them last week, so. But uh, the, the crown has to go back. This is a ceremonial crown. The, the banners I'll keep, uh-huh. And this, the traveling crown down here is one that I get to keep as a memento, I guess, or whatever. But um, it's important that when we travel, we, we realize that there's things that can help us make our clothing look nice while we're traveling. I picked up this um, Black & Decker steam iron, which is, is really nice because um, I, I got it on sale for one thing. It was $25 and I got it for $18. It has a little case and it just makes it really nice to keep your clothes going. For those of you who might have a little trouble with an iron, maybe it's too heavy for you, um, a steamer is really nice. And um, you just fill it up with water and then you want to make sure that you get the one that has um, this little thing inside so that the, it can be half full and still not spill if you should happen to turn it on the side or whatever. Of course, it does retain water, as you will see on my skirt here. Um, and there's other things that we've done, too. Um, I'll just, these aren't clothing things, but it sure helped in traveling. Um, we picked up one of these for like $3.80. If you bought three of them, you got them at $3.80. And here you can, it's got a little hook on it, and you can just hang it with your clothes when you travel. And, um, you know, it can hold all your cosmetics and everything that you might want. And you can leave this packed. That's what's good about this. You don't have to repack every time you go somewhere because you just have littler containers and things and you just leave it packed all the time. And then you don't have to worry about, well, am I going to have this with me or that with me or whatever. Because I'm really forgetful sometimes, so I have to make sure it stays packed. Um, they've come out with this new thing called a diffuser for your hair. Uh, have any of you seen this? It's really nice because it doesn't blow your hair, it actually just dries it right in place if you're usually using the styling gels and things like that. So that's another nice thing to take on the road. And I don't know about you guys, but when I get up in the morning, I have to have my cup of coffee. I mean, I have to. When I was in Florida, um, I had uh, the opportunity of going, deciding that I wanted to have some coffee delivered to the room, and I was real excited when they said that would be 575. <laughs> what? Oh, you've got to be kidding. There goes my, my whole trip. <laughs> but So what I did was that day I went out and I bought a, a percolator and some coffee. And I've taken this everywhere I go because, you know, I get up and have my coffee when I'm ready to have it. And I don't have to worry about $5.75 every time for a cup of coffee. So it was really expensive. And this little thing that I got here was actually a quarter. And I don't know what it, what it once held. But it's, it turned out to be really great for the coffee pot because it has a little bit of padding in it. And then I can carry the coffee in one of these little things. And I carry the sugar in one of these little things. I don't use
use the sugar, but in case someone does. And then I carry my survival knife, you know, so we can make it all over the country. In fact, I'm surprised I didn't get stopped through airport security because I had this little little knife. They probably would have had they seen that. It goes inside the coffee pot, and everything's right inside there. So it works out really well. Is that instant coffee or just No, it, it's perk. It's a percolator. So you smell it, you know, and you, I mean, it's just like being at home. It's just great. Um, so now, if I decide to travel with you, then that means I get coffee in your room? Yeah. Okay. You can come over tomorrow morning and have coffee in my room, too. Well, I won't be here, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> You'll be think, I'll be thinking of you, too. Well, I'll think of you because I'll be making my cup of coffee and my sister coffee 12 Think of me somewhere in the world, whatever, <laughs> making my coffee in the morning because I have to have it. It's my starter fluid. But, um, you know, there's lots of fun. You can make traveling fun for yourself, and you don't have to make it so hard on you. I know another thing when I was having to go out and get coffee was getting up, trying to get ready, and you know how long it takes us to find a place, sometimes if we can even roll to it, to go get the coffee. So this is, this is really nice and handy to have. And you, it, you can, it can just heat hot water, and you could have tea in the morning or, or what it, hot chocolate or whatever. Get your little instant packets and carry those with you or whatever you want to. I also have another neat thing that I found, but I can't travel out of state with it. I have a butane curling iron. Have you ever seen those? They have little tubes of uh, or little cylinders of butane, and they, they're just automatic. You don't have to plug the curling iron in. So when you're going down the street, you know, and you're late for work and you want to curl your hair, you use the butane curling iron, and it works just great. But they wouldn't let me bring it on the airplane because of the chance of it exploding. So there's lots of things that you, you cannot bring on an airplane. You can't bring aerosol cans, at least you shouldn't. She did. If we go down on the way home, it's because of her aerosol spray. I'll probably throw it in the trash can before we leave. But you need to get the pump, the pump sprays and stuff like that because you don't want to take anything that can explode in the air. That's right. And, I, and she's not ecology-minded. We've got to work on her a little bit. She's that's right. Tomorrow's Earth Day, and I'm throwing away your can of hairspray. Don't use it before you throw it. Okay. <laughs> oh, we've had a lot of fun with that this morning. But I'm gonna I'm gonna leave some time now for for you to ask some questions and for us to kind of go over what you're wearing and, and tell me a little bit about how you select your clothes. Tell me a little bit about what. Oh, and the way I travel with my accessories is kind of fun. Um, I take a baggie. And I put my accessories in it, and then I pin it to the outfit, and then I just pack it right away with the with the outfit, so that it's always there with whatever I'm going to wear. And then, as I finish with my clothes, I pack it in, you know, in the garment bag that hangs. I put it back in there, so by the time I'm ready to leave, everything's packed, so I don't have to worry about taking time to pack again. And the way I got my luggage was kind of neat. Um, I talked to the man at Coca-Cola, and he had. I'd seen him at our local pageant, and he said, well, if there's ever anything you need, let me know. And so I did. <laughs> so I called him up, and I said, you know, I really do need some luggage. I don't have any luggage to travel with, you know. And I, and so he said, okay. So a couple of weeks later, I got a check from him, and I went and got some really nice luggage at a discount because I had asked the store previously if they wanted to donate the luggage. They didn't want to but they said they would give me a wholesale price on it. So I got a whole set of luggage for like $300. And it's a really nice nice set. I've got a big bag like this, the garment bag, and a, and a huge suitcase that I carry around. So. Those, those little socks are kind of a lot nicer because mm -hmm. you can really pack a lot. And mm -hmm. my brother used to have it. That's right, yeah. You can really pack a lot. And there's lots of pockets. There's two side pockets. There's the two on front there and then the she big one. heavy for you, right? Yeah. I pack one that's right. Well, I have to bring all this stuff, right, to no, show you guys. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And the the, thing, the outfit that I'm going to wear for the pageant tonight will be a surprise. I didn't bring it down, but the the outfit itself cost um, four ninety five. The jacket cost fifty dollars. But let me tell you why I spent I spent fifty dollars on the jacket because it can go with so many different things, and that's okay to do that. That's a it's what? Actually, it's not a jacket. Actually, it's a swimsuit cover-up, but it was too pretty to be a swimsuit. I don't know who sits on the beach. Wait till you see it. I mean, I, if you can tell me that somebody sits on the beach in this jacket, I don't. I didn't see anyone. That's why I paid fifty bucks for it, though, because I can interchange it with so many things. Now that's okay because I only spent four ninety-five on the outfit, so it's really.
truly a pretty outfit. You'll like it. And then the accessories, of course, were half price, so, you know, I can't beat that. Um, it's called West Trends in Salt Lake, and it's a wholesale distributor. And she now is going to, because of me going to her and talking to her, she wants to be on the committee. She's donating all kinds of jewelry and things for the winners of our local pageant. She is going to donate the crown each year for the, the contestants. So, see, you know, it's not, it's, what you think, some people might think, is not a positive thing, going and asking people for something, <clears throat> turns out to be a real positive thing because they want to get involved and they, they're, you know, they're encouraged and they, they like to do that. It's just, yeah, and no one has ever asked them before, usually. So you have to be out there willing to ask. Do, do any of you have any questions? Or let's, let's talk about some of the things that you like to wear or where you, you shop. And you know, there are some dis are, are advantages to being uh, disabled and in a wheelchair. Because if you get a run down the front of your nylon, you just turn them around. And not, who can't, you know, we get a lot more wear out of them. There's no problem with that. Yeah. Yeah, you just have to watch. Well, and, and as you're shopping for clothes even, um, if you see a pair of pants that's stained in the back, who cares? You're going to be sitting on them anyway, you know, as long as the front looks good. Who cares? Now, where are they ripping underneath? Right where my locks are at on my braces. So, so they don't tear on So you're tearing yeah, up the hem? Yeah. I would say maybe Velcro some of those hems because then you can just keep putting them back into place. You, you know, so you're not actually ripping them. I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Have you tried like the fusible hem? The fusible hem? <coughs> I think what's called. It's, it's, for doing hems, you don't stitch them. Yeah, or fabric glue, even. Or a fabric glue maybe would even hold it tighter than the, the threads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, t the fabric glue. What's wrong with scotch tape? <laughs> it will stick as long. That's right, it'll rip out easier than the seam. Masking tape works well. Duct tape. Duct tape. Yeah, just duct tape the whole entire. You might create a new fashion, you know, <laughs> duct tape. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> 
So we undid it, and they completely took the terminals off, taped them all up. They taped all of the, what do they call those yeah, things? Thing. Connector, I mean, not the, the post, yeah. okay? They taped all those up. No instructions of how to put that sucker back oh. together. I had no idea. I'd never even looked inside of the thing. And so they said, well, don't worry. We'll get the electrician. And I thought, don't worry. I mean, you know, this is not your uh, normal, normal electrical <laughs> current thing, you know. So I called up a medical supply house as soon as I found out that they were going to try to work on my chair. And I asked him if he would mind talking to the electrician and letting him know what he needed to do before he touched my chair. And he said, well, it is very touchy. He could really blow the whole thing, you know, and I'm going, oh, Lord. So when he got there, I had him talk to the guy, and they worked, you know, he talked him through it, and it worked out all right. But, you know, I, it amazes me that they can take something apart like that, not even let you know, and then not even tell anybody on the other end that they need to assist you with your chair when, when they get it off. Yeah, or somebody. They never told anyone there. So when we leave to go back home, I'm going to talk to the, the people at the thing and say, would you please talk to someone back in Salt Lake and let them know that that chair is going to come disassembled and they've got to do something about it and they've got to know how to do it right. Or I'll call the medical supply place as soon as I get to the airport so that, you know, they don't ruin them. the battery inside it. That's about all they left, yeah. Inside the carrying case? Yeah, they left the battery in there, but it was all apart. the wheels Yeah, it was all still there, but it was just everything inside was... And there's two different connectors, I mean, there's two different terminals, because it's a 24 volt. And so there was one piece that was completely loose, and I had no idea where it went. I didn't know positive from negative, you know. I never had to know. Had I known that I had to know that, if that's the way they're going to take it apart all the time, I'll learn how to do that so I know. <laughs> but I had no idea that's what they were going to do. <clears throat> so, anyway, we, we meet circumstances like that. And I remember one time being stopped at the airport, and the, the woman said, Now, are these uh, gel cell batteries? And I said, Yes, they are. She said, Well, I have to look. And, I, and, you know, it's hard to get the strap off anyway. And I said, Okay. I said, but tell me one thing. Are you going to know what you're looking at when you look back there? She goes, no. And I said, well, why bother with that strap? Because if you're not going to know what you're looking at, what difference does it make? So she, she didn't look. She said, well, I guess that's right. I don't know what I'm looking at. So when I used to travel, when I, was, when I traveled on airplanes to go see my brother, and they would Let me tell you another. Get through the door of the airport. 
But let me tell you what sometimes happens, and it happened to a woman in Salt Lake. She's um, a part of the ADAPT group. I don't know if you've heard about them. They're a real militant group who goes out and chains themselves to buses and everything else, and wind up they wind up in jail and everything, and they love it. Um, I don't happen to be a part of that group. Um, that is not to say that I don't agree with them in lots of ways, but I find better ways to do that. Um, the, gr the woman who spearheads that in, in Salt Lake uh, was flying, and because she did not have a companion with her, they would not let her board a, a plane, I think, in Minneapolis. She said, now wait a minute. I travel all over by myself. I do not need someone to, and she was aggressive, very, very aggressive woman, believe me, aggressive. She's been in jail, I bet, six times. Um, but she, they would not let her. She did not, she missed her appointment. She had a, um, a workshop that she was teaching, and she had to miss that appointment because they refused to let her go without an attendant. And that's an attendant paying full price for. You know, that's what bothers me about the whole thing. If they insist we have attendants, fine, but they better let it, that attendant go for nothing. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. But it, it's not to say that if you have good experiences in some areas of the country that you're going to have good experiences all over the country because it just it depends on who's working that day, how they r interpret the policies, and how they interpret you, you know, whether they think that. Now, I have an advantage. I hope I have an advantage because I'm traveling by myself for the first time to Minneapolis or to, uh, where am I going? Grand Rapids, Michigan, by myself. And I've never traveled by myself before, so I hope that, you know, by saying ahead of time that I, I'm going to have this wheelchair, I'm going to need a little more assistance, that they're going to be prepared for it. And if they were going to deny me, they should have denied me as I was making the arrangements rather than uh, as I get to the airport. So I hope by making all those arrangements in advance will be okay. And I think that was the trick. She had to take a different flight out, and they were not aware that she was going to need the assistance or whatever. Now, I also have an advantage <clears throat> that I can use my crutches to get from the, the, you know, from the gate up to the plane. So that kind of makes them feel a little more secure that I can take care of myself a little better. But she had to go up on the stair, the I stair think, thing, I the think ramp. You're right. The, we, the minute we make that first initial phone call saying, okay, I am disabled. Don't try to hide it from them. Right. Bring it right out. I mean, it was a wonderful thought to know that my battery will live on. I mean, you know, yeah. 
long after I'm gone, I guess. I don't know. But we need some funny things. But you know, they don't all have to be negative things. I mean, even that negative thing, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised how many people showed up and were aware of that situation after that. There was the, the gentleman, the bus boy or whoever he is at the airport, bail boy or whatever. Skycap. Skycap, thank you very much, that took the, <laughs> took the luggage. He stood by us to make sure. There was the electrician. There was the general manager from United that came out. Isn't he wonderful? Yeah, really nice. And all these people were now all of a sudden, there was the medical supply house. Yeah. That, you know, all these people were all of a sudden aware of this situation. So it wasn't a negative uh, thing that happened. It was actually a positive thing. A yeah, a negative turned into a positive. So we have to remember that, that even how many freight elevators we have to go up, how many kitchens we have to go through, it doesn't have to be a negative experience I've for us. Some pretty dumpy yeah. ones, huh? And then you don't want to eat to yeah, go back out. <laughs> you know, it's a big I remember thing, a hotel like, I went to, and I got, they took us through the guts of the hotel. <laughs> and they took us through the guts of the hotel. If they only knew how many people turned around and left after they saw the kitchen, they'd make the place accessible from the front, you know, because they really would. In fact, it's funny because when I went to Las Vegas, you know, I mean, this is one of the richest states in the nation. I mean, with all this money that goes into Las Vegas, that was the worst place to get around. I had to go through more kitchens to get to the floor shows. I mean, it was just amazing to me. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, the two. Mm -hmm. And then you say, I don't want to eat here, you know. Thing. And if they're all there, and how many of them are going to turn their backs? Uh, 
But how many have go, go, are going to turn their back on five people? I mean, big deal. And I think five you know, people's nothing. We talked about this real briefly last night about the ADA bill and how we shouldn't have to have a law to tell people how to think and how right. they yeah. treat us. But it's come down yeah. to the bottom line, folks, and it's too late. We're mad and we want what we deserve. Uh -huh. And these other people think that, that we're in the wrong way. for wanting equal rights, but they should have went. They should have woke up 50 years ago, you know, and they didn't. And now, and now they want us to feel sorry for them. I mean, you know, and I, I say they'll get as much sympathy from me as I got from them for the last 30 years, you know. Yeah. It's pretty watered down now, but hopefully it'll it'll work a little bit. They did get through transportation. Yeah, we know we'll have them. This is, I had someone say this to me the other day. I was thinking when we were talking about airplanes, there is a policy in the aviation industry that there cannot be five people with disabilities on a plane one time. That means a deaf person, a blind person, a CP person. Epilepsy. Yeah, any of those things. Five people. And they, um, <laughs> that, if you take that same thing, it says five persons with disabilities cannot ride a plane. You put the word in there, black, yeah. five black people cannot ride a plane together. And it's the same thing. The women are no longer, they're not supposed to be, they're protected by law, with laws against <coughs> the discrimination. So are minority groups such as the blacks, Hispanics, the disabled can still have those that things where you can't sit in the aisle because you're a fire hazard. You can't, can't say a black person's a, a fire hazard. And that, but disabled people, yeah. just because they think, well, yeah, that sounds kind of that will be ACA help back. Yes, oh, yeah. there's a law there. We have attitudinal yeah. barriers and physical barriers. The yeah. ACA is taking care of the physical, and just by forcing yeah. non-disabled people to see it, the attitude is going to be... Well, it's like if a black person goes to a restaurant these days and is denied service because of the color of his skin, he can file a lawsuit. If we go to a restaurant and are denied access because of our wheelchair, we can do nothing but just accept it as the way it is and, and do nothing. That's not strictly true. There's not a precedent set, it, though. It will be until ADA comes into no, effect. you're incorrect in Iowa. In Iowa, really? Send me a copy of that policy or something. That'd be yeah, that'd be great. Um, I was going to suggest something else, which is a variant of, of what I said before. I know one of the problems people have here in terms of going to meetings and lobbying and that kind of thing is problems with transportation and problems in the state capitol, at least with accessibility to the whole capital. And what I have suggested people do, and what I've never seen anybody anybody do except possibly me, is to write a letter saying. I cannot come to the trustees meeting or because I don't have transportation because I'm disabled. I cannot come to the Capitol because I can't you know, get to where I need to be. But can't get out of your building because right, I cannot no because car. and then go on and say, but make it clear mm -hmm. that you're not not there because of apathy. Make it clear that you're there because of a, of a, mm -hmm. a physical you're not there barrier. Because of a well, how many of us even write letters <coughs> to the legislators <laughs> and the representatives? Uh. Some of us do. Some of us. I did not. I'll be. I'll be the first to admit. I did not until I became Miss Wheelchair Utah take an active role in that at all. I thought I'll let somebody else do it. I'm not interested in that. I don't care about that. But then when I got to the legislature and saw all these these bills that affected us, and there were only five people there, I thought, hey, this will be the last time that I'm not there. You know, if I have to take off work or whatever to make sure that I'm a part of that, I'll be there because it's it's so important to all of you all of us to make sure that the, that our rights are protected. Oh, I look in the house of great books and things in the love it loud and they do have a new real chair up in the loud but the gallery is so you can't get up there? Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Well, then you have to be resourceful. You have to get like a winch hoist, and then you just start hoisting everybody up there in front of the whole house, and they'll they'll become aware. You know, I mean, <laughs> you might get arrested. I don't know, but. <laughs> Well, we need them, too. I don't mean to single them out and say that we don't need them. But we need to support them and, and be a part of our the changes in our own life. We can't expect them to do it all. Because they get burned out. I mean, we, we work these people to death, you know, for our benefit. And we need to start helping them out and doing some of that for ourselves and not expecting them to do it all. And if decision makers see only able-bodied people speaking for us, I they know. think we have to be taken care of. That's right. Then that attitude just stays there. The stigma just stays there. You know what's amazing is I'm on a, a committee for the National Forest Service in Salt Lake, and they're building a, uh, a nature trail for the disabled, and it, it's going to be a great trail. They're going to have uh, they're going to check out cassettes for the blind so that they can go around with it. They're going to have uh, the little plates done in braille, and um, it's just going to be great. They're going to have you know the paved uh, walks and all that, but you know what? The campground is not accessible. <laughs> I said you've got to be kidding me. And they said, well, no, but this nature trail is going to be really nice. And I said, well, that's going to be really nice for me to travel four hours to come to this nature trail and not even be able to go to the bathroom. I said, I can't believe this. There's got to be. They said, well, the, the place that's made out of concrete and stone and stuff. I said, well, you, you mean to tell me that inside it's concrete and stone? Oh, no, we have like a petition inside. I said, well, then move the flipping petition. I mean, let's make some sense here. Let's get it out of the way. So, you know, I said, if you're going to put all of this money, it makes no sense, all of this money into this wonderful nature trail, and then you're going to make it so people with disabilities won't even want to come to it because they can't stay overnight. You know, and it's a nice campground. It's fairly new, but you can't even get in the front door of the, the restroom. I mean, it's just, it's it's amazing. It amazes me all of the time. How the camping <coughs> They're not cabins. They're actually just for tents and, um, you know, campers and, and stuff like that. So that part's okay, and it's paved. I mean, it's paved and all that stuff, so it's really nice. But
but <laughs> forget the restroom. <laughs> I mean, you can stay there for a week, but you can't go to the bathroom unless you got your own little porta potty or something. You know, yeah. You, well, you don't want to shower in the outdoors anyway. That's the excuse they use. I said, well, some of us do. <laughs> so, anyway, it's, it's really interesting. It never ceases to amaze me how hindsight people, what hindsight people have. And, you know, they put all this, Chevron oil is part of it, and they put all this money into it, you know. So I talked to the man from Chevron after, and I said, look, promise me that you'll put a little extra money and make that campground accessible. And he said, yeah, we will. There's a quote that on taking a building and renovating it to make it barrier-free costs a lot, but the average cost is like, what, 50 to... $70 is 90% of the cost. <coughs> to us and says, 
you're a special spirit. You know, we have to say something to that person. Hey, you know, well, not really. I mean, I've, I've got a criminal record or something. I mean, you know, you've got to straighten these people out so that they don't think they always have to pat you on the back and feel sorry for you. Some of us ask for that, frankly. Some of us do. Some of us dress, look, and act like we need to be pampered. And I'm sure that all of you have met. I'm, I don't think it's any of you in this, this pageant because you wouldn't be here if you were that type of a person. But I'm sure all of you know those people who I'm talking about. They wear their little house coats. They wear their slippers. You know, I mean, I've even wanted to go up and pat them on the back and say, you poor little thing, you know. But, you know, we have to get away from that, and we have to go beyond that. Um, and it, it, it can be done. You know, we just have to, to look for the right resources and, and become assertive and, and change things. But I, I talk a lot about that, mostly about our abilities rather than our disabilities. And, and I talk a lot about um, our problems with education, our problems with transportation, our problems with um, employment and things like that. And, and try to encourage employers to just give us the, the opportunity. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've been asked when I go to get a job, and I'm sure all of you have, is what would happen if there's a fire in this building? You know, my first answer to that question is, hey, if there's a fire in this building, you think I'm staying? I'm gone, honey. <laughs> you know, I'm not staying here to burn out. So, you know, you have to, and I think when you're being um, interviewed for a, a, a job, you need to be open with them. If they don't address the issue of you being in that wheelchair, you need to address it because you know darn well they're thinking about it. They're wondering about it. They're having um, second thoughts about whether you can do that job or not. So you need to come right out and be open with them and say, let me tell you how I think I can do this job. Let me tell you what I think your concerns are, and let's, let's talk about those a little bit. And I find that that's the best way to deal with people, is to bring it out in the open and say, you know, I mean, it's like, for instance, I, I can get up on crutches, and I do at my job because there's very little space to get around in the wheelchair, so I use my crutches all of the time at work. But now I go out and, and you know, interview for a job, and say perhaps the filing cabinets happen to be high. Well, they're automatically thinking, with me in this wheelchair, how in the heck is she going to do the filing? Not even thinking that, hey, I can adapt, I can get up on crutches, I can do that filing, there's no problem. So see, we just have to bring that to the conscious level of them and let them know that we have ways of adapting. We are adaptable people and we can we can handle it. You know, we do it all the time. I was a little surprised back in 77 when I graduated from college. My school advisor immediately told me to address the issue of my disability on my resume so that they weren't all of a sudden surprised the minute I walked in for my interview. Now that's good sometimes, but I don't totally agree with that because of the fact they will single out your interview, I mean your resume. What you want to do is put everything on your resume, everything positive, and then when you get to the interview, then address your disability. Because they will think that you may never ever get a call if you let them know right away on that resume that you're disabled. That I agree with too. But it has In fact, to isn't be. that what Pat Deal, that's one reason why she never let him show her as having a, being in a wheelchair on TV because she said she was going to send that tape around for different jobs over, all over the country. And she wanted them to see her for what she really was and see beyond that wheelchair. And so, you know, she was able to get a job by doing that. I was that. fortunate enough where places I was seeking employment was places for disabled individuals. Yeah. And, and I had a friend of mine from college that told me about the job. So in that respect, yes, and I would agree with the now Well, in some cases, you have to know where you're going, what you're applying yeah. for. And some then, cases, it can be an advantage to you. Yeah. So you so just got to know how to write your resume for the particular job you're looking for. That's right. And I would do a lot of study on resumes before you write your resume, too. Make it the very, very best resume that you can send in. So, any other questions?
tell you that happened to me one time at the University of Utah. I applied for a job in the theater department and I was hired because of my last name, Garcia. I was no more Hispanic than the next person, but they could put that down on paper, so I got the job, you know, and I thought, well, that's our problem, I'll take the job. <laughs> so, anyway, but, you know, in, in Salt Lake, I, I run another, I mean, I'm kind of another minority, too, because uh, the predominant religion in Salt Lake is um, Mormon or LDS, that I'm sure all of you have heard of, and I'm not either of those, so many of the uh, people who do the hiring in Salt Lake are uh, church-owned businesses or, you know, church-affiliated businesses. So I've had a tough time even finding job in, you know, jobs in some of those places because they won't hire me because I'm not LDS. So, you know, I don't get a job because I'm disabled. I don't get a job because I'm a woman. I don't get a job because, you know, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that we have to go through. My, my mom usually will take care of her. Yeah. She's not liking this at all, guys. She's, she's not. She's, no. she's wanted you to go for it. And then, yeah, uh, now she's not liking it at all. I, I remind her that it was her decision I do this. So. But she, she'll get over it. I figure it's only one year out of my life, you know, and she'll look back on it with, with good memories. We're going to take her to Orlando, Florida with us. Jonette's taking her daughter, and I'm taking Seneca, so she'll have a lot of fun there, be able to go to Disney World and things. I'm We had 10 contestants in the national pageant, um, just 10. Um, man, many times that's because, um, well, for your special condition here where um, you open it up to all disabilities, um, in order to qualify for the national pageant, you have to be wheelchair bound, okay? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And some of the states don't have enough money to send their contestant to the national. A lot of the states have uh, contests every other year so that they can send their contestant um, some of them don't have them, have them at all, so that's why you don't have that many states participating. But um, Utah is a very supportive state. They pay my entry fee as well as my air, you know, as well as the person's airfare to the national competition. So it's kind of nice. It's nice that they they are able to support them that, that much. The Wheelchair America Board designate where you go. No, they they really have no control over what um, it's the state coordinator who pretty well takes care of things. The calls come in to her. Sometimes the calls go into national, but they have very little to say about what happens. They they give you a thousand dollars traveling fee when you win the pageant, when you win, uh, which is eaten up in one trip. It's not much at all. So you don't get much support from there. They do not have national sponsors, which they really need. They need to get some national sponsors that would help with that, but the, right now they don't. The prize package is really nothing to talk about. You know, you don't win a fur coat, you don't win diamonds and, and all of these kind of things. Um, yeah, scholarships. There were not even any scholarships involved. I was very, very lucky my employer put aside $5,000 for my traveling this year and they've supported me 100%. They're um, letting me take educational leave for the time that I'm gone so that I'm not missing any time off work. Um, they've just been great. I don't know what more to say about them, but they've just been really, really supportive. But normally speaking, if your employer wouldn't have been behind you and like, make all these kind of appearances that you're making, that would have had to come out of your own pocket? Well, probably not out of my own pocket. We would have done some fundraising. In fact, they still may have to do that depending on how many more trips come in, but th we might have to do some local fundraising to raise but some money to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, nothing's coming out of my pocket except for my own spending money and things like that. So I'm well, really lucky. They'll tell you when you now wardrobe I pay for myself, but it, you know I don't pay much. <laughs> you all know that now, right? <laughs> my house is also furnished in early thrift store, you know. <laughs> but um, so that doesn't cost me much, and you know I just try to travel. Actually, sometimes I make money on my per diem because I don't eat a lot anymore. So. What they give me for meals, I usually can buy souvenirs with and stuff. So it's it's kind of nice. It's nice to have that support back home. What did you two do? Jonette is. I met Jonette at Instacare where I work. She's actually. She likes to think she's my boss, but she's really not. She's the director of the clinic. I'm under the auspices of the business office of the hospital, but she she's the director of the clinic, and I work in the clinic. So she likes to think she can boss me around, and usually she tries to, but, but I really know what side my bread is buttered on. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, she's really great, and she really supports me a lot. Yeah, she went to Puerto Rico, and then she said, since I won, that all of the other trips were hers also. So I, <laughs> I've had no other choice but to take her along. But I do make her run my bath water. Because it's a Christian concert and she's LDS and she doesn't want to go. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> what does LDS It's Latter day Saints. Okay. Uh, I have a daughter graduating at the same time that the conference is That's real true. <laughs> More important than uh, traveling <laughs> with Kathy. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> really the truth. Take anybody else with her <laughs> that's right. She won't let me take anybody else. I have to go by myself. She says, You will save the money for another trip. So I can't, yeah, that's the one I'm going to. Yeah, you know, along with Johnny Erickson Tata is where I'm going. It's a. Oh, that, oh that'll be great. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot that's of fun. That's one of those that I wish I was going They have some really nice workshops, some really good, good workshops that I'm going to go to there and hopefully take some ideas back. Right, Laura, that's one that I would love to go to. <laughs> yeah, really. Do you want to come be my companion? <laughs> I want you to know, though, she came more disabled this time than I did. She's had a bad back, so I've had to run her bath water. I've had to take her pants off for her. You know, so I don't know. I don't know where it ends. I don't know where it begins sometimes. But she is good. She's a good lady. Any other comments? My mentally retarded foster daughter that I have at home Usually when I'm out of town, we'll go stay with her father. Or uh, if my mother comes and stays at the house, she just stays there with her. But she, she's pretty independent. We've taught her to be pretty independent. When she first came to live with me um, nine years ago now, because she was, came when my little girl was a baby, um, her father told she weighed 300 pounds. Her father told me that she could not do up her own bra. She couldn't uh, tie her shoes. She couldn't run her own bath water because she didn't know the difference between hot and cold. And I thought, well, this, this is going to be interesting, you know. Um, and when he left, later on that day, you know, her shoes were untied. And I said, Janet, you need to tie your shoes. She bent down and tied her shoes. I never did do up her bra. I never have run her bath water. I assume she's not taking hot or totally cold showers because she's making it through, okay. Um, but she was just using her dad, you know. And I think he was doing it for convenience, hurrying and helping her. It's, and I've taught her how to do the, the laundry, not wash it, but she actually folds it and, you know, takes it out of the dryer, hangs it up and folds it. But I can't watch her do it because she takes about 45 minutes or an hour to do one load. So what I, I have done is I sat with her for a long time and taught her how to do it, and then I said, go to your room and do it. So she goes to her room because otherwise I want to hurry and pick it up and do it. And she really enjoys doing that. I, my hands do not touch dishwater. She loves to do the dishes. I don't have to have a dishwasher. She is my dishwasher. So you're keep her. I guess I'll keep her. <laughs> so she, she's really... Yes, yeah. she now weighs 112 pounds. And she's kept that off for about four years now. So she's, she just looks great. In fact, when she first start, started on her diet, I had wished that I had gone on it with her. And then I decided maybe to stay on the diet I put her on. You had to be a little bit mentally retarded to stay on it or something because she just lost weight and she's just just been great. And she always says she can't have sugar, no sugar, she says, because she has to keep her waist down. So she doesn't. she's been real good about staying away from the sugar and things. And in fact, better than I am. She's really good. How did you get Well, when, years ago, when I thought that I was not going to be able to have any children of my own, um, I went to social services and asked them if I could be a foster parent. They put, put us through a foster care class. Um, I was married at the time, and um, he was also disabled. He had polio, and he was in a wheelchair, confined more so than I am. In fact, I used to have to use the Hoyer lift to put him to bed and, and stuff like that because he couldn't transfer at all. You're no longer married. No longer married. <laughs> Not because of that, but because he had an alcohol and uh, drug abuse problem that, that I had to get away from. Um, but he, but, uh, now what was your question? How did you stay in foster care? Oh, that's right. Okay. So we went to these, I get carried away here. So we went to these foster care classes, and they, we wanted to have a small child. And um, the first child that came available, of course, was a teenager. So we said, well, 
Okay, we'll try a teenager. Well, we took one teenager and we never got offered anything else after that because the teenagers are the hardest to place in foster care. So we had 14 of them, one family of five Indian children. And the way we came about getting that family was we had one on foster care. The uh, brother came to visit and I went to take him home to a trailer that had no running water, had no bathroom facilities, and a note on the door that said, gone back to New York, see you later. He had left his son, who was 13 years old, to fend for himself. And so I took him and got him on foster care. Then the daughter came, <laughs> then the other brother came until I had the whole entire family at my house. Um, some of them were on foster care, some of them we just let live there and take care of them. No, it was not an issue. Uh -uh, not at all. I think it may have been for taking children because we never got offered children. I don't know. I, you know, ne you're never sure if you're being discriminated against until you, you know, bring it to a head or whatever. And we never pushed for that because once we started getting the teenagers, we just kind of kept getting them. Yeah, stayed with them. It was kind of a thankless job at times because the Indian children that we had um, came straight from the reservation, and they came with no morals, no scruples, alcohol problems. Um, and it was it was just very tough to di uh, and difficult to deal with at times. In fact, we were kind of criticized because we let them drink in our home before they were of legal age. And the only reason that we did that, or I did that, was because I felt that if we took, they were alcoholics to begin with. They were drinking every day before they came to us. And I figured if we could get it down to them drinking on the weekends and at home, that you know maybe we could slowly taper it off and we wouldn't lose them. And I knew the minute that we said none, they would be out the door and gone to somebody else. And so that's kind of the way we worked with them. They drank on weekends and the evenings at home. And then finally it was like one night a week and then no nights a week, you know, maybe once a month or twice a month or whatever. And today they don't have that problem. There's one that does, but the other, other ones don't. And so, you know, I think it was beneficial to work with them that way. And we we were able to give them something and leave them with something instead of just having them automatically go away. In fact, the, the Indian son that we had, um, one, the first time that he ever said he loved me, he just cried buckets of tears because he had never ever had to tell anybody or felt that he had to tell anybody that he loved him. And he never even told his own mother that, that he loved her. And so it was just a real hard thing. They had a real hard time showing emotions. So it was really hard at times to to deal with them and to know where you were at because of the culture change from the Indian, the American Indian to the to our culture. And they always said, that, um, yeah. in fact, when we'd go places, they'd refer to other people as white women. And I'd be going, well, <laughs> and they'd say, well, you're not a white woman, it's okay. You know, so, but, but they really didn't feel like that. You know, they felt like I was their friend and, and was there for them. And they, even today, they come to me for advice instead of going to their to their own mother for advice and she lives you know, real close to where I do. So it's kind of interesting. It, it was a, a good experience for me, but it was a, a hard experience. That's it? No, I have a question. Okay. Did you get to keep the escort? Did you do this I wanted to. I, I think <laughs> the only reason I didn't get to keep him is because I couldn't remember what his name was. It was either James Farr or James Near because I was trying to make the association, you know, so that I'd remember his name, and then I couldn't remember which one he was. <laughs> so I think they kept him. He decided, if she can't remember my name, she can't have me. He was really cute. With our escorts were the uh, United States Coast Guard, and so they were a lot of fun. We weren't sure they were going to show up there for a while, though. Remember, for rehearsal? They were supposed to show up for rehearsal, but I guess they'd gone out the night before, and <laughs> many of them did not show up, and we were wondering if we were even going to have escorts. But they were there the night of the pageant and looked great. They look better than the stage that they put them on, so. They really made the stage. Yeah, who cares? They're really cute. As you're looking through those, if you have any questions of what we were doing or why we were, if you see one of Sherry kissing my feet, that, after I was crowned, she said, now, now what can I do for you, Your Majesty? And I said, kiss my feet, Sherry. So, she's the state coordinator from Utah, so she, she kissed me. Yeah, she went. She's also the president of the board of the Miss Wheelchair America pageant, so. which sometimes doesn't mean too much, but it's there in on paper anyway. But it was a, it was a fun time. It was um, 
Puerto Rico, you know, you think of it as an island paradise, and um, it really was not an island paradise. It was very difficult for a person with a disability to get around there because they're a ways behind the times. And, of course, all of the stores are upstairs because of the water problem there. So you can get into a lot of the shopping places. Um, curb cuts, there were a few. There'd be one on one side of the street, and then about four miles down the road, you'd find the other one. Um, or people would just park on them. You know, they didn't, they didn't care. That's when I got back at the airport in Salt Lake. Um, in fact, it, it was amazing. The people were very nice and congenial there, and they were more than willing to help. They were very warm people. They would see me going down the street and stop in front of them. They'd come out of their store before I ever got to their store and ask me if I wanted to go in. They would lift me in. I mean, they plywood, anything, they would, they would get you in there. And they were really willing to do that, which was nice. But um, they did not know what accessibility was. Um, as I was going around the streets, I found people were just really staring at me, and I thought, geez, you know. And, and I didn't see any other people with disabilities around, so I asked one of the store owners, I said, um, are people staring at me because there are not that many disabled people here in Puerto Rico? And she says, oh, no, honey, you have a Mercedes. So they weren't looking at me. They were looking at the wheelchair <laughs> because many of the people there don't even have wheelchairs. The children don't even have wheelchairs because it's such a poor country. And, I, you know, I didn't think about that. I thought, Gee. It was an eye-opener for me. But um, as a prize, that I, I got a tour of the island with the one accessible van company that they had there. And I told him I didn't want a, a tour of the island. I actually wanted to see real Puerto Rico. So we went down to this, uh, oh, I don't know what you'd call it, real Puerto Rico. Very, very poor Market Street type uh, shopping place. And in fact, he said, hold on to your purses. And he walked around with us. He wouldn't let us go around there by ourselves. And it was just amazing what you what you could see there. Some of the disabled children that I did see um, did not have w wheelchairs to get around with. They had maybe crutches at the most to get around with, so they, they didn't go very far. They were kind of in their little shops, you know, behind the scenes there. So I didn't see very many of them. One little girl that uh, did I did see in a wheelchair, um, you could tell that her family had a little more money. They were not from there. They were from one of the other states. I don't remember. I, I don't remember where, but she wanted to ride my electric wheelchair, so I put her on my lap and, and ran around with her, and that's all she could say was, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, we're going to crash, we're going to crash, I know we're going to crash. So she was pretty excited about it. It was a lot of fun to, to do that with her, but uh, she'll always remember the electric wheelchair, I'm sure. But we had a lot of fun there, and like I say, they in one of the rooms, one of the girls um, said that her room wasn't accessible, so they took off the bathroom door which made it accessible, and they put it aside by the bed, and every time she would come back to her room, the door would be rehung. <laughs> Say, no, we have to have that door off. So she'd go down, they'd take the door off, she'd come back to her room, the door would be back on the hinges. I mean, it was just a real game they played there because of the communication barrier. They, they kept thinking the door kept getting knocked off, you know, so they kept putting it back up. So finally they had to take the door completely off the floor and put it down somewhere else so they couldn't put it back on. So we were there for 10 days, so it was it was pretty amazing, some of the things. And even the cleanliness there, we were amazed because we asked for some clean... Well, you didn't get a washcloth, for one thing. That was not standard equipment. You had to ask for that special. Um, we wanted a clean glass, and so she took the glass. Jonette took the glasses out to her and said, we'd like some clean glasses, and she was trying to communicate with her. So what she did was took dirty glasses off of the cart, put Windex in them, wiped them out, and handed them to Jonette. <laughs> And we're just going, oh, no. Have we been drinking out of glasses <laughs> like this the whole time we've been here? Now, were you in competition all 10 days? No, we were in competition for uh, three days. Three days. We had the... Oh, we, we yeah, the two days of, of um, meeting with the judges one-on-one, um, -on -one, about three different sessions. We'd start out with, like, five minutes, then 10 minutes, and then 20 minutes. And then we had our three-minute uh, timed speech the night of the banquet. And um, and then the other time, the judges went with us, so I, I think we were being judged all the time, actually. They went traveling around with us and things. And um, if I were to say one thing that maybe made helped me to win the pageant, it was not because I was the, the most educated woman there, not because I had the best job around, but because I loved people. And I actually would reach out to people and, and talk to to strangers. The bums on the street knew me, you know. I mean, 
everybody knew me in Puerto Rico and and I think that's where we all have to come from we have to be ourselves and and reach out to other people and communicate with people and I think that's the biggest the biggest thing for us to to be able to change attitudes of people and I'm just lucky enough to have that as part of me and I don't have to be phony about it so I think if you you're lucky to have that you're you're in good shape so just be yourselves and enjoy the time and enjoy the friendships that you make here because they'll be long lasting you'll take them back wherever you go if that's it I guess we can wrap it up and we'll just look at the pictures and you can just ask me questions and about the pictures or whatever okay I'm here for you Okay. Thank you very much.